Hello, everyone. Wow, it's great to see a crowd. I know we're all interested in learning about the mothership of life. So let me welcome you. I'm Dominic Massaro, president of the Emeriti Association, and I'm happy to uh, introduce our speaker, Harry Noller, who's a Robert Sinsheimer Chair of Molecular Biology. And um, as Emeriti faculty, we sponsor two lectures each year, one in the fall and one in the spring, uh, emphasizing the accomplishments of our Emeriti faculty. And um, I want to say before the talk uh, that after the talk, there'll be refreshments where we can socialize and can continue the discussion. And um, tonight, um, Bill Saxton, the chair of Molecular Developmental and Cell Biology, will introduce Harry. And um, he told me just now that they have 2,000 undergraduates in uh, molecular biology. So I think we're going to learn a lot about the mothership of life can, uh, beyond what Harry has done. So Bill, would you introduce Harry? This is an intimidating audience. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to tell a couple stories here, uh, and I'll make it very short so we don't use up too much time, but uh, beginning, uh, Harry grew up in the East Bay of San Francisco, captive. he was surrounded by science, science buildings, captivated by science. His father was a self-taught engineer who developed the first mechanical calculator, and it had a mechanical memory. Uh, it had over 2,000 moving parts that intermeshed and made the whole thing work. Uh, extraordinary accomplishment that Harry had to look up to. So uh, he ended up in Berkeley, of course. It was a few blocks away. He graduated in 1960 with a degree in biochemistry. And then his first uh, gig, his, oh, wait a minute, I skipped something. Oh, yeah, he, he got a, he, he majored in, in biochemistry, and he had some minor uh, activities in improv improvised jazz and driving cars too fast. Um, <laughs> and something he tends to do still. Uh, so anyway, his first job, he got his first, he wanted to be a scientist. He got his first gig uh, across the bay in Richmond. Uh, working in a uh, biochemistry lab that was studying uh, proteins, and his job was to collect, collect massive quantities of fleas, squeeze them, get the juice out, and then do experiments on the juice. And so Harry was doing this. He was in seventh heaven, doing real science. <laughs> and uh, then uh, he was just getting to, so he was going after the secret of life in flea extract, and he was just at the denouement when a telegram came from the University of Oregon inviting him to join uh, their PhD training program in chemistry. And he immediately looked over his shoulder and said, somebody made a huge mistake. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but he, uh, answered that opportunity, and went up there. Uh, a few years later, he had a degree in chemistry. He had learned how to sequence, do protein sequencing, on, uh, in quest of understanding uh, a very interesting single protein called subtilisin that cleaves other proteins. So a machine, he was trying to understand its structure and how it worked. Um, after that, he uh, took an opportunity to uh, go across the pond to Cambridge, England. He joined the uh, MRC Molecular Biology Labs and started working again on protein sequencing on an enzyme that had interesting properties, again trying to understand a machine. Uh, during that stint in Cambridge, uh, Harry went to a party. He was cornered by one of the lions of the intellectual community of Cambridge, Sidney Brenner, who was a huge figure still. And Sidney cornered him, dressed him down, told him what he was working on was stupid. <laughs> and why didn't he work on something interesting, like a ribosome? And Harry uh, uh, crept away and thought about it, and 
here we are. <laughs> so uh, Harry, uh, after he did a second postdoc in a lab that was just starting to study ribosomes, Harry um, applied for jobs in the States. He got uh, several offers and he toured the States visiting them. And he says that he ended up in the last place in a parking lot surrounded by trees and there were no buildings. He couldn't find the building and he knew he was home. <laughs> and so after uh, multiple decades now, uh, having a great time with uh, brilliant students, postdocs, and collaborators in his research group, Harry has indeed uh, solved this biomechanical machine that has not just one part, it's got uh, dozens and dozens of parts, each made up of single amino acids and uh, RNA uh, bases, uh, equivalent to what his father did, uh, and maybe uh, much more difficult to achieve. Uh, so he's uh, spent years breaking down scientific barriers uh, with those uh, colleagues of his, and now uh, we're here to honor him. Uh, he has been honored many times. He's buried in honors. He's a member of the National Academy of Science. He's been awarded the Robert Sinsheimer Chair of Molecular Biology. He has founded, with some of the funds from uh, ex-Chancellor Sinsheimer, uh, the RNA Center that now has 15 different labs working on RNA here in Santa Cruz. This is the epicenter of RNA research in the world. Uh, so, um, oh, and the last great award was this year he won the Breakthrough, the Breakthrough Prize. Uh, and uh, I'm not gonna give you any numbers, but <laughs> let's just say that uh, he, with the Breakthrough Award, he can finance many, many more years of breakthroughs, scientific endeavors, great parties, improv <laughs> jazz sessions, <laughs> and fast cars. So, Harry. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Bill. I, I'm not sure I can follow that. But, uh, so, a disclaimer to start, uh, if any molecular biologist stumbled in here by accident, I'm going to give a, a general talk and uh, assume that none of you uh, know molecular biology, so that we uh, reach everybody, and uh, so I can try to communicate some of the exciting things that we've uh, stumbled into in the last decades here, uh, a few hundred yards up the hill from here. Um, so the ribosome uh, we call tonight, at least, the, the mothership of life. It's been with us since the beginning of life as we know it, some 3.5 billion years ago. Uh, and it's one of the great questions, where did life, how did life originate? Uh, and especially, how did the ribosome originate? Because there was no life as we know it until there was a ribosome. And as Bill, Bill told you, it, it all began for me uh, um, in Cambridge when I ran into Sidney Brenner at this party, and, and he uh, gave me this very blunt uh, uh, opinion of what I was doing. And uh, it was probably the, the, the best thing anyone ever said to me. And uh, it's what he did to a lot of young scientists. Uh, he essentially said, you know, you've only got one life and one career to enjoy, and you can work on something boring or you can work on something exciting. It's up to you. And, and, it had never occurred to me that it was up to me, but Sidney forcefully uh, 
said that, and this is uh, exactly what he told me. <laughs> so, why are we interested in ribosomes, and why should you guys be interested in them? So, they're fundamental to life and make proteins in every organism. Uh, at the same time, bacterial ribosomes are the targets of many antibiotics. Um, if you kill a bacterium's ribosomes, you kill the bacteria. And bacterial ribosomes are different enough from our ribosomes that we can get away with it without, at the same time, killing the patients. And finally, ribosomes, we think, are linked to the RNA world because they emerged from something because of uh, what Francis Crick pointed out and others, uh, that how could proteins be important for the ribosome uh, uh, if nobody had made proteins yet? So, uh, and that, that leads us into the story. So life is based on two languages. These are two molecular languages. We have, first of all, the language of DNA and RNA, which is the language of what we call nucleotides, G, A, C, or T in the case of DNA, G, A, C, or U in the case of RNA. And the other language is the language of proteins. And you can see there are alices, asp, glue, phi, and so on. There are 20 different amino acids, and, but there's four different uh, bases in, in uh, DNA and RNA, and one codes for the other. These two languages are as unrelated as English and Chinese. There's no correspondence between them whatsoever. And ribosomes translate the RNA language, or which is, comes from DNA, uh, into the protein language. So we have the genotype on the one hand and the phenotype on the other hand. So we have our chromosomes containing our genes and the expression of these genes uh, turns them into proteins that determines who we are. So DNA stores the genetic information and proteins carry out the biological functions. And in between is RNA. So uh, RNA inter is the intermediary between these two things and is heavily involved in translation. So you have messenger RNA which is bringing the sequence of bases in the gene to the ribosome in the form of RNA. And then you have transfer RNA, and the ribosome itself has RNA called ribosomal RNA. So the genetic code is the sort of app of life, if you like. Uh, it's the Rosetta Stone between the very different languages of DNA and RNA and, and on the one hand and protein on the other. So each amino acid is specified by three nucleotides called a codon uh, in the messenger RNA. And the genetic code, which is shown here, um, shows the correspondence between the uh, codons on the left and the amino acids uh, on the right. So UUC, for example, codes for phenylalanine, uh, abbreviated by phi. Uh, uh, AUA codes for uh, isoleucine, or, oh, sorry, threonine. Uh, uh, no, I'm having a hard time reading sideways. Isoleucine, or ILU. So you have a correspondence between the three letters of the codons and the uh, amino acids. There are also start codons. The AUG says start, and uh, UGA, UAA, UAG code for stop. So you have a start signal, and then a message of amino acids, and then when you get to the end of the protein, there's a stop, uh, and that's, that uh, terminates the message. The amino acids are then connected to each other in long chains, and these chains fold up 
in three dimensions to form the protein, which then goes off and does its, does its thing. So the triplet codons are shown here. First in the DNA, you have uh, TTC, TCA, and then the Ts become Us in RNA, but everything else remains the same. So TCA becomes UCA, <clears throat> and UCA codes for serine, uh, abbreviated by SEER, and so on. So that, uh, that's the process. And this is a picture of a, of a section of a messenger RNA actually sitting inside the ribosome. This is its actual structure, and these are three codons, the yellow one, the brown one, and the red one shown here. And the, the message goes through uh, in, in a, from uh, here from uh, right to left in this circle as it passes through the ribosome and gets red. And the intermediary is uh, called transfer RNA, and this is sort of a, a bilingual molecule that speaks protein and nucleic acid. So it, at one end, uh, the amino acid or the growing polypeptide or protein chain is attached. At the other end is the anticodon. And this is a uh, three nucleotide sequence of bases that is complementary to the three bases in the codon. And so the tRNA comes into the ribosome, recognizes the codon here, and then donates the amino acid to the protein chain at its opposite end. So this beautiful L-shaped RNA molecule plays a, a central role, as we'll see. Recognition happens by the same base pairing that forms the double helix of DNA, and that is A pairs with U, or in DNA, A pairs with T, uh, and G pairs with C, and that always happens this way. So this is how you recognize the codon in the message uh, via uh, base pairing. And this was, base pairing is the same base pairing that was discovered by Watson and Crick when they discovered the double helical structure of DNA back in 1953. And uh, this is a picture from their paper in the next year in which they showed in, with great accuracy an AT and GC uh, base pair. And the, the point that they made is that, these, that A paired with T forms exactly the same shape as G paired with C. They're complementary in exactly the same way with the same geometry. And this little arrow here is called a dyad axis and that means there's a twofold symmetry uh, relating the A to the T and the G to the C, and it's exactly the same twofold symmetry for that, uh, for both base pairs, meaning that you could have any sequence of bases in DNA. Uh, and so here we have a, the structure of, of two tRNAs recognizing uh, two codons in a messenger RNA. So you see here there's a an A recognizing a U, or sorry, a G recognizing a C, an A recognizing a U, and another A recognizing a U, and so on. So, as I said, ribosomes are, are ancient. They're also very large. That is, uh, in a molecular scale, um, they're only a, a millionth of an inch in diameter, but that's very large for a molecule. Um, and they have structural cores that are virtually identical in every living thing. I and mean, this is one of the most convincing arguments that we are all related. Every living thing on the planet came from a common ancestor. Uh, ribosomes contain more than 50 different proteins and they contain very large RNAs that make up two thirds of their mass. So this was a big puzzle when I was a postdoc, we were always saying, what the hell is all this RNA doing? This is a functional molecule. It's supposed to be made out of protein. Um, and after coming here, an early experiment in our lab began to make us consider the possibility that the protein synthesis activity of the ribosome was based on its RNA, not as, as, as a protein. And I was a, an enzymologist, a 
protein chemist at that point, and this was not what I wanted to hear. Um, it meant we were going to have to learn about RNA, biochemistry. Uh, and this was the paper uh, published, uh, I guess, the second paper we published from our lab uh, when I was an assistant professor. And the, the, my co-author, Jonathan B. Chairs, uh, Brad Chairs, uh, was an undergrad who uh, uh, had been sort of fooling around during his senior year instead of working hard on his senior thesis. And he came with, in a panic in spring quarter and, and said, can you help me? And I said, well, I, I've got a project for you. Why don't you try throwing some ketoxal into ribosomes and see what happens? And so that uh, started us. And this is a picture of Brad Chairs on the left. He went on to a successful academic career as a, a biophysical chemist, and that's his sidekick, the legendary Jim Hogan, and these guys uh, epitomized Santa Cruz undergrads in the early 70s. <laughs> <laughs> so how does the ribosome work? Um, the function of a bio biological molecule is determined by its structure, that uh, Function follows form in biology. So, um, we, we started on uh, its structure by sequencing the ribosomal RNAs. And I was going on sabbatical, and I just heard that S Fred Sanger's lab had worked out a way to sequence DNA rapidly uh, by uh, using gel electrophoresis. And I wrote to Fred. Uh, and who was in Cambridge, and he wrote back, um, as you see here, encouraging me to, to come to his lab and learn this method and, uh, and, and to try to sequence the ribosomal RNA genes, which uh, posed the, the biggest sequencing project ever attempted at the time. So, you know, but we, we really wanted to know this sequence. So the... Uh, we determined the primary structure of 16S RNA, and that is the sequence of nucleotides in the ribosomal RNA, the, the sequence of bases. Uh, and this was done by uh, a, a terrific postdoc, Jürgen Brosius, who joined us from, from uh, Germany, and uh, Lindy Palmer and Poindexter Kennedy, two, uh, uh, two undergrads. Uh, and, and we finished this in... in uh, 1978, and this is uh, Jurgen and Lindy shown here in a typical pose. Uh, and this is the sequence that, that we published. What you're hearing now is the four bases. And here's the sequence. So this is the music recital hall, right? So Terry Riley and Philip Glass eat your hearts out. <laughs> so then we move to the secondary structure, the next level of structure, which is how the RNA folds into itself, base pairing its G's with its C's and its A's with its U's, uh, the first level of structure. And, and this we did in a, in a collaboration with one of the great uh, scientists. Uh, it was a wonderful uh, time and uh, privilege to work with Carl Woese, uh, who came from the University of Illinois. Uh, and uh, we had a, a wonderful collaboration for several years working out the secondary structures. Carl, meanwhile, became famous for discovering the third kingdom of life called the Archaea, uh, and establishing the relationships between all organisms in life by the sequences of their ribosomal RNAs. And this is Carl, who is no longer with us, sadly, but this is one of the great uh, woesisms here. That, and this is the secondary structure. So the sequence that you just saw and heard uh, then folds up 
according to this base pairing scheme in, into uh, this interesting looking uh, structure, but it's not the three-dimensional structure. It then folds further into a much more compact uh, structure and takes on, of course, dozens of proteins which fold and pack with it. So how can we actually see the structure of the ribosome? This thing is really tiny. Uh, you can barely see it um, um, at that time in, in the electron microscope. So um, ribosomes are, as I said, are only a millionth of an inch in diameter. However, they represent the largest uh, molecular structures that were ever uh, attempted to be determined. So we did this by X-ray crystallography, which I knew, again, nothing about. And this, this gives you an idea. When ribosomes were discovered, this is what they saw, uh, a, little, a little blob in an electron micrograph. And then gradually, some of the best electron microscopists, like Jim Lake at UCLA, was able to pick out shapes, uh, blurry though they were, and then cryo-electron microscopy then gave more and more detail, and finally, X-ray crystallography uh, took us to the atomic level. So I'll give you a, a, a quick overview of, of how this happens. Um, so we first decided to attempt to crystallize the ribosome uh, and then carry out crystallography on it. Um, and this happened with uh, the arrival of two uh, exceptional scientists from Russia, Marat Yusupov and his wife Gulnara Yusupova. And uh, they came to Santa Cruz uh, in the mid-90s and we managed to crystallize ribosomes, and this is one of the, the really fun things about crystallography, is you get the emergence of these beautiful things. Uh, and so these are crystals of ribosomes, and they're quite tiny. They're a fraction of a millimeter uh, across, but each one of them contains on the order of, of a billion ribosomes, all lined up in perfect little rows. And, and so the way that you solve the structure is to shine X-ray uh, beam on the crystal. Uh, very strong X-ray beam in the case of the ribosome, we had to use the most powerful X-ray beams in the world uh, using an instrument uh, the size of a football field called a synchrotron. And this is the uh, synchrotron at, at Berkeley, the storage ring of the uh, synchrotron at the advanced light source where we, we did our first um, X-ray data collection. And so you, uh, this is Marat mounting a, a crystal uh, in, inside the hutch. This is a lead-lined chamber where the, uh, these very powerful X-rays come out. If you, if you remain inside the hutch while the X-rays are coming out, you be instantly blinded, they're so strong. So you, uh, you, you shut the door before you turn the x-rays on <laughs> with, with Marat outside. The, the, and this is sort of a close-up. The, uh, the beam is actually coming out of that, that brass thing. There's a tube behind this. This is a, li uh, a nitro liquid nitrogen source blowing uh, very cold air on the crystal to keep it frozen to pr prevent beam damage. And then the data are collected on the detector, which is sitting here. And wh what do you get out of this? Well, you get a, a whole lot of spots. This is one photograph taken. And for a, a structure like this, you typically take several hundred photographs, rotating the crystal by a fraction of a degree between each photograph. Then you measure the intensity of each of these spots, which means on the order of two million spots. And then using a mathematical uh, procedure called a Fourier transform, uh, you then calculate the three-dimensional electron density of the uh, ribosome. And this was done by a brilliant young postdoc who joined us around that time, Jamie Kate, who came from Yale, is now 
uh, has his own lab, and he's on the faculty at Berkeley. And this is what the electron density looks like. The blue is the electron density, and in white, superimposed on it, is the molecular model that we built into the electron density. So let's, let's see the mothership. So this is a kind of schematic. It's not showing you an all atom representation, but now we'll, we'll uh, morph to all atom, and you can see how truly complicated the structure is. It's overwhelming the computer's ability to render it, in fact. So this is a cross-section then. Inside you see our, our L-shaped transfer RNA. Over in this yellow tube is the messenger RNA that kind of wraps around the neck of the the small subunit, the 30S subunit, and then at the other end of the tRNA is where the chemistry happens synthesizing the protein chain, and this is the nascent protein chain. It goes through a tunnel here and emerges and folds up in three dimensions uh, when it emerges from the ribosome. So we'll show you the, how the tRNAs and messenger RNA sit in there. Uh, they're actually inside. You can see, we'll, we'll fade out the ribosome here, and you can see the, the three tRNAs. There are three binding sites for tRNA, and they're reading the messenger RNA here. So there's a wonderful molecular animator in, in Australia, Drew Berry, who has made a, uh, a movie of protein synthesis. So uh, I thought I would show this, and I need to say that the, the details of this movie are now incorrect as we know in, in detail, but it gives you a general idea. And he did it many years before we know, knew what we know now. Uh, but uh, it's a beautiful. So this is the messenger RNA coming out of the nucleus of the cell, the cytoplasm, where the small subunit of the ribosome first attaches to it at the start site and then the large subunit. And then here are the tRNAs swimming around, randomly trying out the codons until they find the correct codon. up to its three-dimensional shape, which happens automatically. 
off it goes to do its biological job. So, while this machine is working, we have to move the tRNA and the messenger RNA through the ribosome. So one of the most challenging problems in understanding how the ribosome works is how it moves the tRNA and the messenger RNA, which is, after all, an actual mechanical function. Um, it moves through the ribosome, moves the tRNAs through from right to left, as shown here. So it, they, they come in here and move to here, move to here, uh, and the message, messenger RNA moves uh, along with them, and that has to be tightly coupled. It's shown schematically here. So the ribosome turns out to be a machine with actual moving parts, as, as Bill said earlier. Um, so how do you see the motion of the ribosome? Well, we, don't, we aren't able to go down to a millionth of an inch with a movie camera and watch it. Uh, and so the way we've done it is to trap the ribosome in intermediate states of its motion uh, and then uh, put these snapshots together into a movie. And these are the people who did it, uh, J Joe, the crystallographer, and my wife and collaborator, Laura Lancaster, John Paul Donahue, and Sri Vidya Mohan. Um, so here is a view of this motion, just looking at the small subunit, the 30S subunit, starting out in its ground state, which we call the classical state. Um, and first rocks, and then the head moves, and then it moves back. So it has three main states that it goes through in moving the tRNA from one side to the next. If we see that first we see the whole subunit rock, and now the head will rotate, and then the whole thing will rotate back. And repeat as necessary. So I'll now show you the, the same thing, but with the, the entire ribosome now. Um, so we're looking at the small subunit from, from the back side to begin. And now from the top, you can start to see the tRNAs moving down here inside. The rotation of the head of the small subunit. You also see many things are moving. And almost nothing is stationary. The ribosome looks almost like it is alive itself. Very fluid molecular object. So this has taken us then into molecular mechanics. The next question, okay, that, for example, one of the key movements is the rotation of the head of the small subunit that moves the ends of the tRNA and the message uh, physically through the ribosome. So how, and this uh, is shown here to remind you this rotation of the head domain. So, how does the ribosome create rotational movement of the head domain? So you're working here with molecules. So what we discovered is that rotation of the 30S head domain originates at two molecular hinges in the RNA connecting the head to the body. And this is schematized here. This is the head, and this is its connection to the body. The body would be down below here. And there's, there's a hinge here which we call hinge one and hinge two up here. And this was worked out by Sri Vidya Mohan. And this is a movie showing the two hinges. So uh, one hinge is here and the other hinge is here. The, the body remains more or less stationary. So here's hinge one and up here is hinge two. And this is the 
acts as a rotation of the head, which doesn't correspond to either hinge, but the two hinges combine to give overall uh, a rotation of the head of, of the subunit, which creates the motion. Here's a, a view of uh, the bending of hinge two right here. And that unexpected bonus, in, in the process of working this out, we discovered how an antibiotic kills bacteria. And this happens to be spectinomycin. And, we, uh, and people had puzzled over this because it didn't make any sense, but they didn't know about hinge two. Spectinomycin works literally like uh, throwing a wrench into the works. Uh, it jams hinge two by binding right in the middle of the hinge, preventing it, uh, blocking its, its, its hinging motion. So we now see that RNA not only can carry genetic information, uh, which it still does in many viruses, such as uh, flu virus, cold virus, uh, HIV, uh, polio virus, but uh, it also uh, is able to catalyze biochemical reactions, as, we as was discovered uh, uh, with the uh, discovery of ri ribosomes, catalytic RNAs. But it can also carry out large-scale molecular motions, uh, sort of like what, what our muscles do. So is the ribosome a fossil? of an RNA world. So the ribosome is made of protein and RNA, but most, if not all, of its functions are determined by its RNA, uh, not its protein. So you could say, well, was the first ribosome made exclusively on RNA? And of course, uh, we weren't the first to think of this. Uh, already in 1968, the year I arrived in Santa Cruz, Francis Crick in Cambridge was saying this, it's tempting to wonder if the primitive ribosome could have been made entirely of RNA. And people shook their heads at this crazy statement by Francis Crick, but uh, people learn not to do that when Francis Crick speaks. <laughs> so life as we know it is based on the idea that the genetic information is stored in DNA and then DNA replicate, is self-replicating, and then you make a copy of RNA the messenger RNA, which is then translated into protein. So before the arrival of DNA, RNA could have stored the genetic information, and DNA would then evolve from RNA uh, as a stable way of storing genetic information. It's much more stable chemically than RNA. And so you would have a, a, an RNA protein world in which RNA carried the genetic information and, uh, and then was translated into protein. Um, but we now know that RNA is able to carry out biological functions previously thought to be exclusively uh, done by proteins, that is, catalysis, enzymatic reactions. Uh, and this was discovered by Tom Cech, uh, Norm Pace, Sid Altman, and their colleagues, for which they received a Nobel Prize back uh, in 89. And it's widely believed since their discovery that uh, life originated in an RNA world where RNA served the functions of both DNA and protein. So in the RNA world, it would be very simple. RNA makes RNA makes RNA, uh, and RNA does everything, as we believe uh, here at Santa Cruz. Uh, <laughs> but why did the R uh, ribosome evolve from an RNA world? Why would you ever want to make protein if you could do everything with RNA? Well. We now know that little pieces of protein can enable RNA to fold into many different three-dimensional structures that RNA by itself can't fold into. So what we propose is that the ribosome evolved to make little pieces of protein, and these then stabilize new RNA structures, making RNA uh, a better RNA, so to speak. Uh, and then, since protein contains different chemical groups, it could also bring 
uh, new chemistry to the RNA to further uh, increase its uh, range of abilities in catalyzing biochemical reactions. Uh, and then finally, these small pieces of protein got bigger and floated away and started doing stuff on their own, and, and that would be the birth of, of actual proteins. So something like that seems uh, a likely scenario. And we're, we're continuing to try to think of all the, the steps by which uh, this could have happened and the ribosome could have evolved. So now, uh, in the RNA center, as, as Bill Saxton said, uh, there, we now have 15 RNA labs uh, at Santa Cruz and uh, spanning the complete range of, of RNA research from RNA genomics to RNA structure to uh, RNA genetics, cell biology, uh, and so on. And this is the campus where the human genome was first assembled, as, as you probably know, back uh, at the turn of the 21st century uh, uh, by uh, Jim Kent, David Hausler, and their colleagues. Um, and we now know the human genome, each of our genomes contains about three billion base pairs of DNA. But only 2% of our genome codes for protein, which means uh, and uh, this pretty good estimate is over 90%, maybe as much as 98% of our DNA codes for RNA. And we know the biological roles of only a tiny fraction uh, of this 98%. But we already know that it includes RNAs that are crucial for gene expression and, and uh, defects in which can have, can impact human health, including uh, giving rise to cancer. So an enormous challenge confronting the RNA center for the future is to identify the RNAs that make up our dark matter of biology and to understand uh, their biology down to the atomic level. So this is a, uh, you know, this is a, a, a moonshot sort of scale of, of a project, but uh, not unthinkable. So. Uh, here we are poised at the edge of, of this new challenge, uh, and uh, the fun never stops. Uh, and this is where we get to do this in this wonderful place. Thank you. So I was told that uh, I should uh, entertain questions if there are any. Yes. Great question. So if we look in, at the outside, at the overall structure of bacterial ribosomes, archaeal ribosomes, they look very similar. And all, all bacterial ribosomes are almost superimposable, uh, although their, their actual RNA sequences and protein sequences change a lot. But they have the same three-dimensional structure. Now, if we go inside where the tRNAs and messenger RNA are sitting, where the, where the machinery is working, all the crucial stuff is happening, codon, anticodon recognition, catalysis of, of uh, protein synthesis, um, 
Those places are virtually identical in bacteria, archaea, and us. Every living thing, as far as we know, uh, when, you, when you look at those crucial things that are interacting you know, that mechanistically, they're doing the work, uh, those are just uh, mind-blowingly conserved. I mean, we have sequences of RNA as long as 15 nucleotides that have absolutely no, not one single base change in any living organism. So this is nature's way of saying, you change that and you die, right? <laughs> so the ribosome is maybe the most conserved object in all of nature. One of the things I was trying to understand from your talk is at one point in anthropology, when we were developing at the court tale of you scientists, we, we tried to imitate you guys, and we were saying that the same farm may have multiple functions. From you, I gather that you are saying that the same farm may have just one kind of function? I did not understand that part when you were saying. The same? The same farm. Uh -huh. yeah. There. I'm just trying to ask, what yes. is the relation between farm and function? Yes, yes. So the the function of all ribosomes is the same in explaining why they're so conserved. Each part of the ribosome has a, a different sub-function. For example, binding the transfer RNA, binding the messenger RNA, moving these things, and so on. And, and those are each different in detail when we look at them. And we're still trying to understand how they all work, but the ones we've seen so far, for example, I showed you the, these two hinges that twist like this. Uh, it's sort of like the twist. Uh, Loki and I are old enough to remember that, uh, that you rotate your hips by bending your knees. And this is exactly how the head of the 30S subunit of the ribosome rotates. Uh, so I think there's a different story for each functional part of the ribosome where each subfunction is determined by a different structure. So I think it, it does follow this idea that form follows function, or function follows form. How could we use ribosomes to synth synthesize nanotechnology building blocks? <laughs> that is a great question. Uh, yeah, the rib ribosome is a nano machine, or maybe a pico machine uh, even. But um, people have thought about this, about programming ribosomes to synthesize chains of things that are not actually amino acids, but related to amino acids that would have properties that could be used for novel technologies. Um, so the, the ribosome is, is definitely programmable, and I think the, this aspect of the ribosome, I think, is yet to be tapped uh, for the kinds of things you're you're talking, people are thinking about it and attempting with using microfluidics and so on uh, with ribosomes. Uh, but I think that's a, a, a very promising future uh, possibility. back to the beginning of time for RNA 
<laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, it's, we can only go back to, uh, in terms of fossils, we can, we can pick up the uh, things called stromatolites that were discovered in Australia. And they've been dated at 3.5 and maybe 3.7 billion years ago. So just maybe a couple of hundred million years since the cooling of the planet. So you have at least looking at the overall age of the planet, a fairly narrow window to go from atoms to life. Um, Stromatolites are believed to be cyanobacteria, the skeletons of cyanobacteria, so to speak. Um, they look like morphologically like, like cyanobacteria, that is uh, uh, blue-green algae that they used to be called, but bacteria that, that do photosynthesis. Uh, and so they were back there near, near the beginning. Um, Well, you know, things are fragile, especially microorganisms, so it's hard to, it's hard to recover the natural history of, of what happened back then. But, you know, we, people, when I first came here, people were telling me it was impossible to reconstruct evolution. So uh, now, we, now we do it routinely, uh, at least back to the common ancestor. Let's see, there was a question, uh, Mike. Yeah. Uh, this wonderful lecture answered uh, a puzzle that I had when I came. Uh, how come that uh, ribosomes synthesize proteins, but they are made partly of proteins? And then you explained that the primitive uh, ribosomes uh, apparently, it uh, was Crick who came up with the idea that there must be primitive ribosomes without it. I mean, it's a fairly obvious idea that you can make the ribosomes partly of protein if they have to create the protein. Uh, but uh, I guess my, so the, que but the question I have is, you have all these wonderful motions, hinges and so forth, but what is the nature of the forces that cause the motion? Okay, so the question is, what are the forces that we're hearing from a uh, distinguished physicist here uh, who's thinking of forces and energetics, uh, which is what we absolutely have to think about. Um, so one of the biggest motions, the inter subunit rotation that you saw, um, this is rotation of the small subunit, which in molecular terms is huge at 800,000 uh, molecular weight. Um, we've seen that this happens spontaneously just from thermal energy, no input of uh, biochemical energy at all. It can, we can watch it happen in real time spontaneously. So, as you would say, KT is driving that, the, uh, the thermal energy that's around us all the time. So, but we do use energy in making proteins. We use something called GTP, guanosine triphosphate, which is a high energy compound that gets burned up. For each amino acid, we burn up one molecule of GTP. And what we think is that the main reason for that is to make these things go uh, unidirectionally. So we're fighting this, again, in, in physics, there's a thing called entropy, uh, which you can say, for example, when you light a match, it, it uh, lets off heat and light and smoke, uh, and that happens spontaneously. You never hold a burnt match in front of you and see light and heat and smoke come back and give you a a brand new match, right? So that's what entropy is all about. Um, so 
even though this motion can happen spontaneously, we think that maybe the most important use of energy is to make it go in one direction only. And not, otherwise, you would, the tRNAs would go back and forth like this, and you would never make any protein, for example. Time scales of the motion that you showed us. Oh, the, the time scales, another good question. Um, each amino acid, well, you, you, you make about, you, you incorporate about uh, 10 to 20 amino acids per second. So, so, it's rather slow. so 50 milliseconds or so. It's very slow. But during that time, you have 50 different tRNAs floating around, and only one of them is Mr. Right, you know, for the codon that's sitting in the ribosome. You know, you have a codon of, say, UUC, and, you know, 20 or 30 tRNAs have to poke their anticodon in there and say, no, that's, that's not me. And then finally, so in, in a, uh, a tenth of a second, all these dozens of tRNAs try it, and the right one happens, and you make the peptide bond, and you move the thing. And, and so a lot happens in that 50 milliseconds. The hinges are made of RNA, yes. So, as I said, R, R, RNA, uh, you, can, you can create uh, a moving molecule out of RNA. Okay, I think maybe that uh, exhausted everybody.